بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. We are, for those of you who are new, we are talking about the lives of the prophets. The series that we've been discussing is the detailed lives of the prophets from Adam alayhi salam. We've been talking about each prophet until now we have reached the last part of the story of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Prophet Musa alayhi salam, this is our part seven of his story and inshallah tonight will be the last part of that story before we move on to the next prophets after him. Brothers and sisters in Islam, so in our last class, we spoke about Musa alayhi salam speaking to Allah in the mountain of Tur. And we said that Tur has two meanings. It's either the name of the mountain or it can literally mean mountain. It is in Sinai. Sinai is, Sinai is a mountain or a place in Egypt, right? And there's a bit of controversy on that. Nobody really knows exactly where this mountain is, even though there are claims. But I advise you, do not believe any of the claims. We don't know exactly where, but most likely in Sinai, Sinai, only because it's kind of mentioned in the Quran, but in a different context. So there's a point on that. Uh, mentioned Sinai as possibly being probably being the place where Musa Salam spoke to Allah in the mountains of Egypt close to Palestine. And we also spoke about the children of Israel worshipping the calf. It wasn't a big cow, it was a small cow. And we mentioned that this was inherited from the beliefs of the Coptics in Egypt, the Copts, uh, the Pharaoh kingdom. They used to worship a calf. They worshipped many gods, one of them was a calf. And the children of Israel had inherited some of their beliefs and they were still, it was still in their blood. In fact, Allah mentions this exactly in the Quran Surah Al-Baqarah. He says, The worship of the cow and the belief in the powers of the calf was actually inside their bloodstream. That it entered into their hearts and their hearts were made up of it. They can't get rid of it. SubhanAllah, there are still people around the world here, whether you are from Lebanon like myself, or you are from, even from Palestine, from, uh, if you are from Africa, some places of Africa, or in Turkey, or um, you come from anywhere around the world. In India, for example, India is very commonly known for worshipping of different idols and things. Even among the Muslims, you'll find there are still ancient beliefs that are still stuck in them. Even though they're Muslim and their belief is totally different, but they can't get rid of it. And I encountered a lot of that when I was back, when I was about 14, 15. My family members up in Lebanon, their village, they used to have these ideas of the worshipping of saints, the graves that they used to build for them. And they used to make special offerings to them and they had this special belief about them. You can't cut their trees and it's sanctioned and I don't know what. And all these different beliefs I don't want to go into, okay? Alhamdulillah, no one believes in them here. Yeah, Alhamdulillah, they're moving away from that belief. But these beliefs are not unusual for people who have just seen the, the sea split. You know, we, we, saw, we have the Quran with us and still there are these beliefs, right? And these children of Israel kept believing in this. It's very hard for them to get rid of those beliefs. And really, it was very difficult to find righteous people among them. Like we spoke last week about the most righteous of men among them, there were 70, 70, mentioned in the Quran, 70, who went with Musa I said, I'm saying that they want to see Allah with their lives. And Allah SWT made them die, and then He raised them again as a punishment. They died, they raised them again, and they repented to Allah SWT from being obnoxious, rude, arrogant, in disbelief. I mean, SubhanAllah, all the miracles Allah had shown them. They came back, they were worshipping the calf. We spoke about the samurai who made them worship the cow and how he did that. We referred to last week's talk. And then we spoke about how Musa alayhi salam brought to them the uh, planks of verses of the, of, the, of the Torah which Allah had given him. And there were commandments in there. And that they also refused to follow the commandments in there until they see what's in it. So Allah lifted the tour, He lifted the mountain over their heads. In another uh, tafsir of the ulama, they say that the mountain next to them shook 
and they feared that it was going to fall upon them. So then they accepted what was in the Torah to follow the command, subhanAllah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa alayhi salam and Harun to go with his people, walk with them in the night and day until they reach Al-Aqsa, the holy land, Al-Quds. So they were actually inside of the territories of Palestine that we know today, inside of the boundaries of Palestine is known today. But Al-Aqsa, Al-Quds is inside of Jerusalem. Yeah? Jerusalem is inside of Palestine, yes? So they had reached to Palestine, but outside of Jerusalem, outside of Al-Aqsa, the holy city, Al-Aqsa, the third holiest city and the first holiest mosque is Masjid Al-Aqsa. If you pray one prayer there, you know it's not any salah, it's if you pray one follow prayer in Masjid Al-Aqsa, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is in this hadith of Bukhari, how many salah are you counted as? Who knows? Huh? 500, I've got up Allah, Jazakallah Khayr. What about in Medina, Masjid al Nabal? Do you know how many prayers one final prayer is equal to? How many? Huh? 1,000, correct. What about in Mecca? If you pray around the Kaaba in the Haram there, how many prayers is one final prayer equal to? Hmm? 100,000, I can see over there. Answered and looked away, humble, mashallah. 100,000, sahih. 100,000 salat followed in Masjid al Haram in, in, in Mecca and 1,000 Masjid al Haram. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned Nabawi 500 in Al-Aqsa. That's how important these masjids are. Al-Aqsa, my dear brothers and sisters, has the most of the prophets of Allah that have passed through there. And many of their graves are there. Some of them, we, we don't know where they are actually. And today you will see Musa Alayhi Salam is also buried there as well, very close to them. Right. So he told him, go to Al-Aqsa and then you must enter it. If you enter it, it will be written for you. Well, it's already written for you, meaning if you enter, it's going to be for you. It's guaranteed. You don't have to do anything. SubhanAllah, when they reach the doors, there's a door in a, in a big wall that marked the boundaries of Al-Aqsa. They reached there and SubhanAllah, they sat down. 700,000 people, children of Israel or so, they sat on the floor. We also talked about this last week. I'm just going through it very quickly. They sat on the floor and Musa and Harun were shocked. They said to them, Enter the holy land that has been written for you. And we said, when Allah said it's written for you, it means they have to do something. It's written doesn't mean that it's promised to you without doing anything. You have to do something. If you do it, then it will be written. And you understand the verse later on? They said, No, there are. People, they weren't like giants, giants, big people relative to them, probably twice their size. They said, and they are too strong for us. We won't enter it, they'll beat us up. So then Musa and Harun pleaded to them, said, Enter the land which Allah had written for you. All you have to do is just enter the door. Just enter upon them the door. Just get through the gate, and Allah will give it to you. If you just enter the gates, you have won. And subhanAllah, they even increased in their arrogance. Right? They sat down on their butts, they extended their legs out, and they put their hands with their palms open behind their back like that. And they rested on their arms and they said, Ya Musa, qalu Ya Musa, inna lanna dukhulaha abada. We will never enter it. SubhanAllah, a direct disobedience of the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So long as they are in there. And we will not enter until they get out. We want to expel these people. Until today, we see a fragment of them who are called the Zionists. They're not the main Jews, brothers and sisters. Let me repeat. The Zionists who are now occupying illegally in Palestine, that we hear of, they are not... They are not the mainstream Jews. They are not the majority of the Jews. 80% of the Jews of the world back you up about this. They don't agree with the Zionists entering. In fact, they work more against them. You've seen their protests in America and other places. They stand very you think they're Muslims fight. Now, they have a different belief. They say it's going to be theirs later on, but let's just ignore that for now. 
but they do not agree with the Zionists and they think the Zionists, they say about the Zionists as being the terrorists among them. They are the extremists among them. So don't confuse the two. The Zionists are the fragments of them and they are doing the same to the Palestinians. They enter the land, first of all, as refugees. There they became residents, honored and respected. Then came something called the Balfour Declaration and then, well that's when the Balfour Declaration happened. And then afterwards, subhanAllah, with the help of Britain, what they did was they forced uh, Palestine to become an Israeli state for them illegally against international law. And subhanAllah, till today, the war and the battle has been between them, occupying land that is not theirs, and they want to expel anyone who doesn't agree with their laws. Or, in fact, they expel them out of their homes for, for another Jew or another Zionist. Um, or in order to build their land, and they just demolish homes and demolish families. They don't care about them. So, the people of Banu Israel from among them came these people. And so, they can see the same language. We will not enter until we expel its people. Now, Allah doesn't want to expel its people. Allah said, enter it and you will be given authority. But we're not taking its people out. We're the families and children. They've lived there for a long time. You know, we're not going to make prophets enter it. And these prophets are going to expel people. The prophets were not sent to divide people and to cause racism and to cause disunity between people. And that's exactly what that's exactly what Musa did by saving the children of Israel from who? From Pharaoh. And what did Pharaoh do? He divided the people in this hierarchy. And what are the children of Israel doing now? They're repeating the same thing that Pharaoh did to them. SubhanAllah, today the Zionists are doing the same thing that Pharaoh did and the same thing that Hitler did to them. They're doing it to the Palestinians, SubhanAllah. In our school, as a teacher, we always learn about bullying. And one of the studies, they tell us, when a bully bullies, right? It's because that bully has been bullied. Something about our psychology. We want to bully the people because we've been bullied. We feel like the world owes us something. So this is a mental problem. This is something that can turn into evil when we have been there. And now Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he came to unite the people and say to them, uh, do away with racism and nationalism. And I place it under my foot today. It is, stink, it is like a stinking carcass. You are all brothers and sisters in Islam. And those who are not Muslim, they are Dhulmis. Dhulmis means they are a trust with the Muslims. Those who are not at war with you. you can't harm them either, not Muslims, who are living in peace with you. Brothers and sisters in Islam, obviously the word Dhulmi has more to it, but that's another topic. But let's go on. They said we will not enter it. They sat back and said something very rude, obnoxious. They said, Go you and your Lord and fight, both of you. We are going to sit right here. We are going to move. So then Musa started calling up to Allah saying, Allah, oh my Lord, I do not possess except myself and my brother. Oh Allah, separate. Separate us, our action and our belief, from the actions and beliefs of the corrupted people. Please don't make us one of them. Don't count us as part of them. We are innocent from what they're saying and doing. And so Allah sent down the verse. He said, Allah said, and therefore as a result, as a punishment for them, they are going to be lost in the land that they are in for 40 years. They will not be able to get out and they don't know where they are. So do not feel sorry for those who are corrupt. As a result, the children of Israel start were lost in this land called, till today the story is called Ardu the land of lost people. Just in Palestine, outside of Allah, somewhere. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not leave them alone. He still gave them mercy. And that's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala subhanahu A murderer murders and still goes out and drinks from Allah's rain. A rapist rapes and still eats from the produce that Allah has given. Is that correct? That's the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Rasulullah said that Allah said, and if it wasn't for the righteous people who make things right that still exist on earth, 
And if it wasn't for the animals and the creatures who need the water and the food, Allah would have not given any of it to anyone else, to the evil people. But because of the righteous and because of the animals and the creatures, Allah SWT still gives even to the evil people. Because it's not going to deny them at the expense of denying the righteous and the animals. That's the Prophet ﷺ said. But anyway, the children of Israel, Allah SWT, what he did for them was this. There was a big rock, big, and he said to Musa alayhi with your staff, hit the rock. From this rock, 12 fountains came out. Okay? 12 fountains, each fountain for each bloodline of those children of Israel. There were 12 bloodlines. 12 family trees that go all the way to Yaqub Yaqub is also called Israel and they came from 12 forefathers each fountain was for a tribe 700,000 of them were from 12 tribes they're called Asbal 12 Asbal and the rock every, it will only work when you put it on the floor the fountain will come when you carry it on the camel or the horse or whatever it won't work Right? And if anybody stole the rock, it won't work. It has to be among them, among the people, and you'll work. This miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to create fairness between them. Not only that, he continued to send down upon them this thing from the, from the clouds, a special thing. And they used to find it on trees and on, the, on other places. And they used to extract it and make almost anything they wanted. It, it made all sorts of things like bread and dough. And it made the, uh, other types of nutrients, which they used to make in different types of food. One day... They got sick of it and they said, Ya Musa, call your Lord so that he can, you know, send upon us uh, grazing land. We want to graze land, we want to plow, we want to dig, we want to farm. And we want to, you know, things like onions and garlic. Allah, Musa said to them, what's wrong with you people? You want to exchange that which is good that Allah has given you to that which is worse? SubhanAllah. That is the state, this is a lesson. When we want something thinking it's good for us, when in actual fact it's not good for you. And this is why a person must be patient with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will not bring upon you something when you ask him that's bad for you. But Allah says, وَقُلِيَطَ الْإِنسَانُ مِنْ عَجَلٍ Man was created too hastening. Too hastening. And now with social media, the technology of our phones and social media, today I fear for the younger people, just on a little bit of a tangent here. They become even less concentrating and less patient. Why? Because they're always scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Get used to fragmenting your attention. Every day we're fragmenting, looking up, looking back down. When you keep doing that, you get into the habit of losing concentration. You can't concentrate for a long time. Right? And what happens is that when your focus is like they say now, studies have shown, fish have an attention span of seven seconds. And some children now have an attention span of less than a fish. Because of social media. So, the point is that I'm trying to say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He advises us to be patient. And some people will say, what's this patience, what's this patience? Now, you've got to be patient. The world is not built on hastening. Use your brain. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and work through it. Work through it. Let, the sail, let the boat sail with you and rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do what you can. Everything has treasures in it. Anyway, the children of Israel could not Understand this. Yeah, I'm going to do this, do that, do this, do that. So Allah SWT has sent upon them onions and garlic. They had something better, more nutritious. Now they want onions and all the onions and garlic are quite nutritious. But what Allah sent upon them was even more. It took care of everything. But no. They wanted, and whenever they asked for things, they always asked to make life harder on them. Now they've got a plow, they've got to hurt their backs. Their lifespan is going to be shorter. They're not going to live longer because they're tired and they're wearing out their bodies. Allah first of all sent them as luxuries, as kings, but now they want to plow and wear out their bodies. SubhanAllah, not happiness. My brothers and sisters in Islam, happiness is not the goal of life. There is no happiness in life. There is no happiness in life. Life is not paradise. If this was paradise, if this was paradise, I wouldn't believe in God. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created paradise, He will not create a cruel world for you. This is a testing ground. And you will never be fully happy here. 
No sadness lasts forever, no will happiness last forever. But I'll tell you what lasts forever. Your belief in Allah and your connection with your Creator, paying for the hereafter. And number two, contentment. Learn that word. To be content, the difference between happiness and content. Whatever Allah has given you, you are content with. Don't sit there comparing yourself to those who have got better. Don't sit there comparing yourself to everyone else and thinking that you're missing out. This is what causes depression, anxiety, uh, uh, stress, especially on social media. We see people showing their highlights of their life and we think that we're missing out. But really, it's fake highlights. You know, the best moments of your life are captured 33 seconds and everybody sees a million of people and you think that they're living the beautiful life and you're missing out. You're being betrayed. It causes depression, it causes anxiety, it causes stress. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you, look at those who are less, less, less fortunate than you, so that you do not forget about the fortunes that you do have. Everybody does that. And always thank Allah and look after the weak and innocent so that you can thank Allah for the marriage that He's given you. Brothers and sisters in Islam, next, the children of Israel, what happened? Now, there are two main stories. One of them is about a man who was murdered among them, and they wanted to find the killer. And another story is Musa alayhi salam meeting a pious, knowledgeable man who had more knowledge than Musa alayhi salam. He was a prophet. Now, these two stories, the story of the man who was killed was definitely during the time of the lost one in those 40 years. As for the story of Al Khadr, his name is Al Khadr, this pious man, Musa alayhi salam, met who taught him things. It's in Surah Al Kahf. This story could have happened there. But I lean towards the opinion of the scholars that it actually happened before the children of Israel were released. It actually happened when Musa alayhi salam was still in Egypt before he was even sent to Pharaoh. This is another opinion. Why do I go with that opinion? Well, Musa alayhi salam seems to ask questions and is impatient. The character of Musa alayhi salam with al khalil seems to show that Musa alayhi salam was not yet a prophet, not wise enough yet. And that this man Al Khadr is more knowledgeable than him, teaching him as he is preparing him for what is to come with Pharaoh and the children of Israel. Anyway, brothers and sisters, I'm not, I cannot for sure say that it happened in Egypt before he was a prophet, nor can I say for sure it happened in Al Abi, the land of Lostwood. It doesn't really matter, but you've got to see that this is a lesson for Musa and a preparation for something to come. So I'm going to start with the story of Al Khadr. <clears throat> in Surah Al Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Musa alayhi salam once he had an apprentice, Fata, a young person that was with him, helping him, and he was teaching him. And there's this narration saying that someone asked Musa, Ya Musa, who is the most knowledgeable man on earth? The person on earth. And he said, I am. Now that narration, I could not find authenticity to it. But it's there in the books. However, if it is true, it goes to show that perhaps Musa was not yet a prophet either. Because a prophet doesn't talk like that. Right? Because Allah says in the Quran, وَفَوْقَ كُلِّ مِنْ Every person who is knowledgeable or has due knowledge, remember, don't boast. Allah says, over every, every scholar there is a great scholar. Over every knowledgeable person there is more of a knowledgeable person. Over every wise person there is more of And that's what Allah says in the Quran, فَلَا يُزَكُّ Never praise yourselves that you are most pious, most wise, most knowledgeable. It is Allah who knows who is truly more God fearing. And that is the essence of ikhlas. Ikhlas means sincerity. And these are the people shaitan cannot affect. The people who are humbled in everything they have. They always are humbled. They never see themselves superior to others based on a few blessings Allah gave them. Yes, they thank Allah. And they talk with humbleness. And the true slaves of Allah, Allah mentions in prayer, says, they are the ones who walk on earth with humility and humbleness. And when the ignorant, boastful people talk to them and talk to them harshly or roughly or whatever, they get out without replying to them in the same way. They say salam. They find a way to get out with, with, uh, with wisdom with self-respect, okay? It doesn't mean you don't face a person who tries to prove the truth false. It means that the way they address and the way they handle situations is with wisdom and self-respect. 
someone says to you the F word, you don't reply the F word back. That's not what a Muslim is. They say Muslim woman will be fahash, wala da'an. A woman does not, is not dirty now, then he's not a cursing type of a person, right? Even the Jews uh, who hated the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu when he went into Medina, one time they wanted him to say, Wa alaykum as salam, because they love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, dua, peace be upon you. They want the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the believers to say, Wa alaykum as salam, because they had doubt in their own religion. They knew the Muslims were on the right, so they wanted Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to make dua for them. They knew he was truthful, so they used to come up, but they were too arrogant to say, Salam wa alaykum to him, salam. So they cut out the na, the na in Arabic, and made it sound like a salam wa a sam is death or poison upon you. So they used to say to him, Salam wa alaykum. The Prophet وسلم, he caught that out. The Muslims used to reply the salam because Allah says, if you are greeted with, with a greeting, reply the same way or better, even with the non Muslims. But at this time, the Jews were making a trick. They said, Salam wa alaykum. And some people couldn't hear it very well. They, they thought that they were saying, Salam wa alaykum. The Prophet picked it up and he said, when they, the Jews, say to you, Salam wa alaykum, say wa alaykum only. Why? Because they're saying something else. And they want you to say something better. So instead of you say wa alaykum as salam and they're saying death upon you, and you say, poison upon you, or death, and you say peace be upon you, it doesn't make sense. It's not equal. So you say to be equal, say wa alaykum and upon you. But don't add to it. Like person who hears that there was someone who wanted to swear. And upon you, you this and you that. Say wa alaykum. In fact, one time, Rasul was met to a group of Jews, says salam, salam wa alaykum ya Muhammad. Salam. And uh, Aisha the law on her hood there. And she got angry. So she starts to shout at them and abuse them. Prophet said to her, Laya Aisha. No, no, no. With gentleness, with wisdom, think. Think before you talk. Did you not hear what I said to them? I said, Wa alaykum. And upon you, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Alright? And that burns them even more. So that's what a woman is like. So where were we at? Musa alayhi salam. Did what? What we're talking about? <laughs> yes, knowledgeable. So Musa alayhi salam. One day Allah said to him, "Ya Musa, there is a man whom we have given knowledge which you don't have from us. We have given him knowledge. No one taught him. I taught him. And this is to tell Musa, be careful." If you're going to go to learn from this man, then I have taught him knowledge that is not from the common worldly knowledge. You cannot, for example, if it was today, you can't say science cannot explain it. Physics cannot explain it. Common sense cannot explain it. It's knowledge beyond the, the knowledge of anyone, any human being, any common sense. It's beyond it. Yani, I'll give you a very brief example so that you can understand the logically what I mean. How can there be a knowledge beyond common sense? You might think, well, if it's knowledge beyond common sense, then it's 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 absurd. Am I correct? But we say this is nonsense. It doesn't make sense. Fair enough. But if you believe in Allah and the creator of the universe, then there is knowledge that to us may seem nonsense because we cannot comprehend it, so we call it nonsense. But a wise person goes deeper and knows if it comes from Allah, it is not nonsense. It's beyond our sense. And just to give you a very good example, the black hole. Have you ever heard of the black hole? Have you ever heard of the black hole? The black hole in the universe, till today, scientists are unable to explain its existence. It exists, but they say, and even some scientists didn't want to believe in it the first time. They were hesitant. Why? They said the black hole defies every law of physics that science knows. It's completely against the physical world. It's completely against every science, every physics. It cannot be explained how. No formula, no calculation, no physics, it defies it. It defies the laws of nature. But it exists. But we don't say this is nonsense. Scientists before, at the time of Einstein, they wanted to call it nonsense. They couldn't. It was established. But now Allah is telling Musa alayhi salam, we have given this man knowledge from us. Meaning, you will never be able to comprehend it, so don't even bother. But I want you to meet him to teach you something else to be ready. 
your children of Israel, these people that you're going to go to later on, they're going to be people who are going to be in the same way that you are going to be to this man. See how knowledgeable you are, Musa? And how they are, very ignorant. I'm going to show you so that you can be prepared for these people. So you can have, you, know, you can feel and understand what the level of intelligence your people have. And that's subhanAllah the wisdom of da'wah, of a dad or a teacher or a prophet. What happens? You've got to be able to understand your people's mentality. Your children, you've got to be understand, you've got to be able to put yourself in their shoes. Right? But emotion, get too emotional on them. You're gonna take it step by step. They don't understand what you understand. So Allah wanted to prepare Musa Islam for this by meeting a man who is way beyond the knowledge of this world, and Musa is gonna to be to this man the way the children of Israel are gonna to be to who? To Musa. You understand? So Musa Islam became enthusiastic. He has to go. You know, he, he loves knowledge, right? He wants to learn what is this knowledge. So Allah said to him, You will find him and where the fish, where the fish will wake up, will become alive, and it will swim in the sea. It will swim in the sea. At the meeting of the sea and the land. There was some sea meeting in the land. There are different opinions today where it is, but it's somewhere outside of Palestine. Probably the Tigris River, I think, maybe a lot harder. Maybe, maybe something else. But the point is, Musa alayhi salam, he took his apprentice and went there. When they got there, right, Musa alayhi salam and his apprentice, they were fishing and they caught a fish and then they put the fish in the basket so that they could eat it later on their journey. As they kept walking along, uh, Musa Islam sat to rest. He took a nap and his apprentice went to fish again. As he's fishing, he goes, he noticed the basket or the bucket move. And the fish jumped out of it and swam into the ocean. And he was amazed by what he saw. He wanted to tell Musa, but Musa Islam was asleep. So then he waited. And afterwards Musa Islam woke up and the apprentice forgot to tell Musa about the fish. So they walked. After a distance, Musa said, Okay, bring us our lunch. Laqad laqina. Now, ghada doesn't literally mean lunch. Ghada in the Arabic language, just an Arabic lesson for you. It's actually the morning, when the sun at the zenith of the sun, just before the afternoon. Ghada, ghada was actually when the sun had risen halfway between top and halfway between sunrises and ghadad. So it's actually breakfast. She so said, bring us our breakfast. We are tired and hungry. And that's when the apprentice remembered and he said, no. Do you remember when we sat at the rock over there? Huh? He said, I saw the I forgot to tell you about the fish. And he swam into the ocean. Amazing. About the story. And Musa Azalem got so excited. He says, That was what we were after. Allah Yahdi, what did you tell us? They started to follow backwards their trail. And there is a little hint of a lesson here for us. If you are lost in anything, you're lost in your way, walking, you're lost in finding something, you're lost in your memory, you're lost in your guidance, your understanding, what do you do? Go backwards. Back, go backwards step by step. Where did you trip? Go back and revise it. Even at school, you don't know your math work, or maybe you're too much ahead. Go back and learn the formulas beforehand. Where did you go wrong? Then slowly get back up. So this is a lesson in life that when you are lost, go back and follow your trails. Musa salam went back on his trails, following the footsteps. When they reached that destiny, Allah says, They found a slave among our slaves. Now I need to point uh, make a point here. Whenever Allah subhanahu wa mentions a specific person and says, Abdan min ibadina or Abdana 
and specifically one person saying our slave it generally means that he is a prophet what does it mean he is a prophet Allah only calls his prophets in the Quran in the singular or if they're in jewels or in threes but referring to the prophets it's say Abdana okay Abdana so he says Abdan min ibadi and the majority of scholars agree that this man's name was Khadr, which means greenery, and he was a prophet. He was a prophet, not just a righteous man. Without going into too much detail, this is the opinion I lean to. The majority of scholars agree that he is an enemy. Majority. Even the Daymi and the Dayim, the great scholars, if you know about them, and even the great scholars of today, he is an enemy. So did the other previous scholars of the he was an enemy, a prophet. He comes up to him and says, Can I learn from you what you have been taught of, of righteousness and guidance? What does this man say to him, Al Khadr? He says to him immediately, without any introduction. He doesn't ask him what your name is. He doesn't introduce himself. Musa doesn't introduce himself. He just said, Can I learn from what you have been taught? Why? This again shows you that both and Musa is salam, maybe is a prophet or maybe close to being a prophet or maybe at the start of being a prophet. He knows that Allah will not tell him something that is uh, that, that is wrong. So immediately he knew that this man is a prophet or he's a knowledgeable man being a prophet. Well, he doesn't need a tradition. He says, can you teach me what from what you have been taught of guidance? And then Al-Khadr replies in the Kadanta Stati'a you are not going to be able to be patient with him. You can't handle it. You know that saying? That we all know, you can't handle the truth. Give me the truth. You can't handle the truth. And this is exactly what happened to Musa and Khalid. You can't handle the truth. You can't handle it. You can't be able to handle it. Musa alayhi salam looks and says, that's an unusual answer. He says, Qada, sitajiduni insha'Allah sabi. By the will of Allah, you will find me patient. He says, Insha'Allah. And he says, You will not be able. Musa says, Insha'Allah, I will. So he's doubting himself now. And I will not disobey anything you tell me. Khadr looks at him and thinks, There's no point in discussing more. We'll just go on the journey of the test. Al Khadr knew that Allah had sent him for a test. So if you follow me, there's one condition. Do not ask me about anything I do. Until I choose when and how I want to tell you. Don't ask me anything. Just go on. Watch and then I'll tell you. Don't even ask me. I'll tell you. Musa a.s. agreed. Because I want to. Allah says immediately they got up, not wasting time. They went. Al Khadr walked, Musa said, walk path after him, his apprentice went. Hatta ida rakiba, hatta ida rakiba fi safina di khawatana. When he reached a boat or a big ship, Musa broke it apart. He started to vandalize it. Qala akharatana li tuhriqa ahlana laqad jidda shayhan imra. Musa says to, I'm oh, sorry. When they reached the ship, Al Khadr, not Musa, he went down to the bottom of the ship. They welcomed him. They said, Come onto the ship. Uh, they wanted to cross the sea, and they were very nice people to them. They welcomed them. They gave them food. They gave them a place to sleep inside their ship. They did not ask them for any money or anything. And they were very pleasant to them. They went down to the bottom. What did Al Khadr do after all that? He repays them by vandalizing the ship, stuff breaking. Musa couldn't handle this. He says to him, oh, did you break it so that the people in it can drown? This doesn't make sense. And Imran, you have brought something that's, that's, uh, that's not right. It's not right. It's not morally right. And Khadr replied, one answer. Qala alam aqul inna kalan tasrafi ala ya sallam. Did I not say before that you will not be able to handle what I do? You're not going to be able to be patient enough. Now here, Al-Khadr is saying it lightly. 
موسى عليه السلام رمى بالزر ماتوا اخي Please do not hold me accountable for what I just forgot. I forgot. I forgot. Not only that, he says, Please don't, like, don't do my head in about it. Just you know, don't give me a lecture. Just, I understand. I know what I did wrong. Please don't talk to me more than that. I already feel embarrassed. Don't lecture me about it. Don't do my head in about it. Don't make me carry more of a burden. Please. Just let me go. Don't rub it in. Al Khadr goes. And then they reached another place. Allah says, When they met a young boy, probably at the age of 10 or 11, Al Khadr walks up to him and kills him. No questions asked. Musa alayhi salam sees a bucket of shit. Alright, killing an innocent boy? That's even worse. أَقْتَلْتَ نَفْسًا بِغَيْرِ نَفْسٍ لَقَدْ جِئْتَ شَيْئًا نُكْرَى He goes, you've killed an innocent soul. He didn't do anything. He had brought something outrageous. Now, Al-Khadir is also now, he gets a bit more firmer when he says, هَلْ أَقُلْ لَكَ He adds a word, لَكَ, which means, okay, now you're going too far. هَلْ أَقُلْ لَكَ إِنَّكَ لَنْ تَسْتَطِيعَ مَعِي صَبْرَى I'm going to remind you one more time. Didn't I tell you that you will not be able to be patient with what I'm doing? Musa is so embarrassed at this point. He can't ask him to forgive him. He can't ask him to give him another chance. He just goes straight to the point. He goes, If I ask you one more time, don't, don't walk with me anymore. I'll just, I'll just turn my back and get walking. Allah said, I don't deserve to know from I've done enough, I've burdened you too much. I, I've gone too far. It's okay. So they reached a village. That village, they were very hungry, Musa and Muhammad, and they were very tired. So they go in and they asked them to feed them, they asked them to give them a shelter. It was a known custom throughout the world. If you find strangers who are traveling in the desert alone, you must give them hospitality. Otherwise, you are a wicked, vile people. Even the enemy gives you hospitality. Instead, they abuse them, they rebuke them, they kick them out, they hit them, and they throw them out. Musa is obviously angry, given his nature. As they were walking out, they see a wall that's about to collapse, and the people are trying to rebuild it. So Al Khadir runs to the wall and he helps them rebuild the wall. After he rebuilds it, he walks away. Musa is and looks at him and says, I mean, all right, he helped them with the wall. He could have asked them to just give us something, a repayment for helping them for our labor. He didn't ask anything wrong. You know, you help someone who's been cruel to you. He didn't tell Khadr you did something wrong. He didn't tell like like the sheep or like the boy. Now, this was a right. Musa is talking absolute right. I mean, we're tired. They're supposed to give us hospitality. All right, we went and helped them. We're hungry. Shelter, at least you know, tell them to pay us for our work. Al Khadr said, Okay, that's it. That's we depart. No more. You're not patient. Musa is said, I get very upset with himself. Al Khadr said to him, But before you go, someone of people can be the leading man and the stopper. However, I will tell you the interpretation of what you could not be patient with. See how he's always repeating patience? He's preparing him for speaking. He said, As for the ship, and I'll just say it in English, it belonged to a family who was poor. And the only place of income they had was the sea. Delivering goods, fishing in the sea. They had no other income. If they didn't have their ship, they will die of hunger, in other words. Okay, so why break their ship? He said, the route that they're going by, like they, they take routes, yeah? Routes, route. I'm going to say route the Aussie, just sounds bad. <laughs> Is that right? Say route. Is there people watching? If I say the Aussie, well, they're going to say, 
relationship with your swear. So I'll just say route. On his way, the ship takes different routes. Now, he said on one of their routes, there was a tyrant king. And every good looking ship it was taking it by force of its owners. And we feared that they will lose their life. So I wanted to break it apart so that if they go past that ship, that man or that king, when they go past, the king will leave their ship alone and might take it. Now that information Musa would have never known. Only Allah knows it. And so I did that. As for the boy, this is a tricky one. And until today we still can't understand it. It's an old Allah. But here it is. He said, the boy, his parents were good. And Allah knew that that boy was going to grow up to be a tyrant and force or try to force his parents into disbelief and evil actions. So your Lord, not me, your Lord wanted to exchange those parents with a righteous child. And a better one for you. So he took that boy before that. So in other words, this is now in brackets. And this is what some of us would say. He took that boy out of mercy. So that the boy will not grow up to be a tyrant. And for the parents not to suffer from his tyranny. And instead Allah rewarded them with a better child. Now, Allah does not talk to us any more than that. He doesn't tell us the context, the background, why then, why not others. But obviously there's something special within the infinite knowledge of Allah. Have you ever heard of Qadr? Qadr? A Muslim cannot be a Muslim until he believes in six things. Allah, His angels, His books, His messengers, the hereafter, right? The hereafter, Jannah and Jahannam, and the life after death, and Qadr. Qadr means that Allah has made things into destiny and it is knowledge of the unseen. Things happen beyond our control and their knowledge is completely only known to Allah more than the other time. But we accept it. That's a test. Allah wanted to take that boy for the reason so we should not be asking more questions. But why? It's unfair. Don't you know Allah is fair? Isn't he al -adil? That's enough for us. Don't you know Allah is the most merciful? That's enough for us to know. He will not do something unless there is a wiser infinite wisdom behind it that we cannot comprehend. Musa accepted. Then came the people of the village. He said, that wall belonged to two young boys and they were orphans. Now listen carefully. These orphans, Allah wanted to look after them. Okay, so why did you build the wall? Under the wall, there was a treasure for them. And you saw how tyrant these people were. I feared your Lord. I feared, not your Lord, sorry. Your Lord wanted to hide the treasure. If those people saw the treasure, they were going to take that treasure from the orphans and leave the orphans without anything to look after themselves. And here is an important part of the verse. He said, and their father was a righteous man. In the hadith, their father was not their direct father, nor their grandfather, nor their great grandfather, nor their great great grandfather. It was their seventh great grandfather. Seven generations ago, they had a righteous father. Which meant all the children of that grandfather that came afterwards, seven generations were all righteous. Look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looked after the seventh generation of that great 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 grandfather. Then he raised the great 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 grandchildren. The effect of the work of the seventh great grandfather kept going to the seventh generation. And the benefit continued, the blessings of Allah. Allah looked after those boys because of their seventh great grandfather. So Allah wanted these orphans to grow up when they're strong enough, they can get their own treasure and they can look after themselves and people can take it away from them. Brothers and sisters, the end of my point that is. Rasulullah said, إِذَا مَاتَ بْنُ آدَمَ قَطَعَ عَمَلُهُ إِنَّا مِنْ When the son of Adam dies, all of his or her actions are no longer counted. He can't pray anymore, he can't fast anymore, is that correct? 
It said three things. They continue for the dead person. An ongoing charity they left behind. An ongoing knowledge that is beneficial, which they left behind. Well, like if you taught your son or your daughter this in that before eating, that's an ongoing knowledge. You walked with your daughter and you saw a homeless man and you bought uh, sushi for that whole homeless man. Your daughter learned generosity and looking after the poor from that. You died and your daughter learned to and taught her children. That's an ongoing sadaqa and knowledge. See how simple it is? Wallahi, if you taught your children to enter the toilet, because of the sunnah, that's an ongoing knowledge. The toilet. Can you imagine that? And third thing, a well of salih in the for a righteous child who makes the heart for Now we know from this verse, any righteous child in your generation, even if it's a hundred years later, they can still benefit the righteous man who died or the righteous mother who died a hundred years ago. So my brothers and sisters, we leave the legacy behind, not wealth, not fortune, not something like that, not to some, you know, whatever. We leave behind us the legacy of values and righteousness in our children. Allah. And look how Allah only gave it to the children. Even the, yeah, the dua of a righteous person cannot benefit more than the child to their parents and the parents to their children. Why? Because the seventh great grandfather, this is his work. So his work continues. So the best dua for you is your work, which you left behind. Different between somebody living on social media or emails something terrible, which their friends and everybody starts uh, using, such as one of the other haram pictures. Backbiting, leaving behind some kind of gossip that people keep reading. How is that going to benefit my brother or sister? Be careful. If it ever starts a good deed, you will have the reward of that good deed and the reward, a copy, a copy of the reward of everyone else who copies you in that good deed. And if you start off a bad deed, you will have the sin of that bad deed. And the sin of everyone who, and, and the copy of the sin of everyone who copies you in that battle. Now, this is what the verse teaches us. And so Al Khadr said to Musa, This is the interpretation of the things which he could not be patient with him. Musa has had to be blessed. And so he was prepared for his people. I'm sorry, it's not the end of the story of Musa. We still got the cow that we want to talk about, and Musa's own death, followed by the second prophet who was called Joshua, and the entrance into Palestine, and then Dawood alayhi salam and Sulaiman. That, inshallah, next week, we finish it here, inshallah, ta'ala, and next week we'll have part eight of Musa alayhi salam, and whatever comes after it, please come at the same time to be not a bit of shah, approximately eight o'clock. Jazakum Allah, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.